good morning. Uh, so good to see everybody this morning. Uh, my name is Derek. I want to welcome you to Northside Christian Church, whether you're here with us in person and brave the cold weather, uh, and we're here warm today, of course. Uh, or if you're watching online, we we'll welcome you this morning as well. Great to have everybody. If you're new, I uh, want to especially welcome you. Uh, we're thankful that you have spent uh, your time this morning uh, with us to celebrate uh, our Lord and Savior and to worship as a be part of this uh, church community. Uh, a couple things, uh, quick announcements. Um, on the bulletins back there, you know they have those little QR codes. Uh, if you scan that with your phone, you'll get taken to the Connect card, the digital Connect card. Uh, I'd certainly love for it if you take a minute or two just to fill that out. That's just just a way for you know you all to get in touch with the church, the church get in touch with you. If you have a prayer request or a need, you can certainly make that known there. Um, there's those paper copies are still back there in the back. If you want to fill one of those out and drop it in the offering box, that's another way you can do that as well. Uh, of course, if you want to get a hold of the church, you can do that via email. It's office at nschristianchurch.org. That'll get a hold of any of the staff. And then, um, you know, if you want more information uh, about the church, you can do, you can check out the website. It's, uh, nschristianchurch.org or follow them on Facebook. Great way to keep up to date with what's going on and news and notes and all that stuff. Uh, with that, I'm going to lead us in prayer, and then we'll continue with our time in worship. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much just for the opportunity to come together this morning. Thank you for um, the sun and um, the warmth that kind of radiates even with the cold air. Lord, we thank you for um, for this week, Thanksgiving week, the reminder of... Um, the reminder of all that you've blessed us with, the reminder to be thankful um, and to worship with a thankful heart. Uh, Lord, for this morning, I just ask that you be with us, that you uh, be present in this moment, in this time uh, for us together. Help lead us, Lord, into a conscious contact with you. Um, Lord, I pray for Wayne and the worship team. I pray for um, Nick as he delivers the message this morning. I just pray for, uh, for them. And Lord, for us, would you open our minds and help open our hearts to hear and receive those words and the courage to take whatever step uh, you want us to take towards you. Lord, in your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and join as we sing together today in the eye of the storm. One, two, three. In, in the, the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet, between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. And when I realize I've been sold out from my friends and my family, I can feel the rain reminding me. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the
and the test comes in and the doctor says I've only got a few months left. It's like a bitter pill I'm swallowing. I can barely take a breath. And when a sickness steals my baby girl and there's nothing I can do, my only hope is to trust in you. I trust you, Lord. This week's scripture is Psalms 145, 8 through 13. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise him, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your domain endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all that he promises and faithful in all that he does. You may be seated. As we continue our worship together, let's sing about the thanksgiving that we have in our hearts. Thanking Jesus, giving him the praise and glory.
heart climb in desperation I turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the darkness your loving kindness saw through the shadows of my soul the work is finished 
morning. Good to see everybody today. I want to welcome you to Northside. Those of, again, you, those of you here in person, those of you online, we're glad to be together here and to share in this time together. I want to share with you a story about a talented young musician back in 1983. 1983, this talented young guitarist was kicked out of his band in the worst possible way. The band had just been signed to a record deal, and they were about to record their very first album. But a couple of days before recording began, the band showed this guitarist the door. Uh, Just nothing, you know, no warning, no discussion, no dramatic blowout. They literally woke him up one day by giving him a bus ticket. That's how they, they woke him up, here's your bus ticket, go home. And the guitarist is sitting there on his way back to L.A. from New York wondering what happened. How did this happen? Where did I, what went wrong? What do I do now? You know, record contracts, if you're not in, uh, familiar with the music business, they don't exactly fall from the sky. <laughs> That's something that really takes a lot of work and just kind of things coming together. It's not something that happens every day. And especially when your, uh, your specialty is raucous metal Heavy metal music. That's just not, you know, that's a hard thing in that time. So he's sitting there asking himself, have I missed my one and only shot? But by the time his bus hit L.A., the guitarist had gotten over that self-pity and had vowed to himself he was going to start a new band. And he decided that this new band would be so successful that his old band would forever regret their decision. He would be so famous that they, those others would be subjected to decades of seeing him on TV, hearing him on the radio, seeing posters of him in the streets and pictures of him on all the magazines. They'd be off flipping burgers somewhere, loading their, their gear into ti- you know, ti- their tiny van after their tiny gigs, and he'd be over there sell, you know, rocking out in full uh, sold-out stadiums on live TV. He'd bathe in the tears of his betrayers, and each tear would be wiped with a crisp, clean $100 bill. I mean, he would be living the life. That was what he determined. And so the guitarist set to working, and according to uh, uh, author Mark Manson, he worked as though he were possessed by a musical demon. He, he spent months recruiting the best musicians he could find, far better musicians than his previous bandmates. He wrote dozens of songs, and he practiced on the guitar religiously. His seething anger fueled his ambition. Revenge became his muse. And within a couple of years, his new band had signed a record deal of their own. And a year after that, their first record went gold. That guitarist's name was Dave Mustaine. And the new band that he formed was the legendary heavy metal band Megadeth. Megadeth would go on to sell over 25 million albums and tour the world many times over. Today, he is considered one of the most brilliant and influential musicians in the history of heavy metal music. Unfortunately... The band he was kicked out of was Metallica, (laughs) which has sold over 180 million albums worldwide. Metallica is considered to be one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time. And because of this, writes Manson, in a rare 2003 interview, a tearful Dave Mustaine admitted this, that he couldn't help but still consider himself a failure. Despite all that he had accomplished, In his mind, he would always be the guy who got kicked out of Metallica. And we hear that story, and at first you hear that, and and maybe we hit it with a little bit of a perplexing thought, right? Like, how could this be? You know, here's a guy who's reached so much success. How could he still consider himself a failure? But we don't have to sit there very long to figure out how someone could get into that mindset. Anger is a very important emotion. Anger is what alerts us that injustice is happening, right? That's the bell that goes off inside of us. When we get angry, a lot of times it's because we feel something unjust is happening somewhere. And that's a valuable thing to have happen. We need that sort of warning bell going off in those moments. It helps us also to understand when we've been hurt deeply. You know, we we need that light on the dashboard that helps us to see that something's going wrong. Like there's something that's happened to me that I I shouldn't be okay with. But... If we continue to live in anger, it'll end up stealing a whole lot more from us, far more than it ever gives us in return. And that's where he was. He was living in revenge and living in anger and could never shake it, was never able to get to that place of contentment. 
I've heard it said many times over, and maybe you have as well, that we live in an outrage society, right? Everybody's outraged about something. Everybody's outraged about everything. Everything outrages us. We are just outraged by everything. According to Mark Manson, again, he says, right now, anyone who is offended about anything, whether it's the fact that a book about racism is assigned in a university class, or that Christmas trees are banned at the local mall, or that the fact that taxes were raised a half percent on investment funds, he said, anyone who's offended about anything feels as though they are being oppressed in some way and therefore deserve to be outraged and to have a certain amount of attention come their way, right? We need a certain you know, amount of people that are kind of taking our side. We want to feel that, oh, yeah, okay, we're not the only ones, right? So we, 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 we have to get that out there and we want to get that attention i can identify with this earlier this week i was in a local restaurant i'm not going to share with you which one but i was in a local restaurant it's like everybody knows you know if you came in this morning it's like 30 something degrees outside right it's like it's like frigid and i'm in this restaurant and i'm trying to sit there and enjoy the food and get a little bit of work done and i i'm telling you folks i I didn't have to go over to the thermostat control to know that somebody had the air conditioning on in this place. And I am sitting there, I am wearing my full-on heavy Carhartt jacket inside the restaurant just to keep myself warm. My hands are just frigid. You know, I, I couldn't stay there very long. And the thought came to me, oh, I just want to, there's a part of me just wanted to go to social media. I didn't have a Facebook feed. And I just wanted to, I, I just wanted to be like, to so share my outrage, you know, like who would put on the air conditioner when it's like 30 some degrees, you know, like, and, and I just wanted to go spew it all over the, all over the internet to get those attaboys, you know, like, oh, that, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, you're so right. You're so right. They shouldn't have done that to you, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to get that so I feel good. Thankfully, I didn't do that. <laughs> but the voice was there. You know, here, here, you know, you just unload it. And here's this restaurant full of employees. They probably don't even have access to the thermostat control, right? Like, it's probably some computer somewhere else that's like controlling the whole thing. They have no choice. They're just trying to serve people and get, and get a paycheck. But those of us, we know how this goes. We know we have that power. And with social media particularly, we will destroy more with it when we use it that way than we will ever build Political cartoonist Tim Kreider put it this way in the New York Times op-ed that he wrote. He said, outrage is like a lot of other things that feel good, over, but over time devour us from the inside out. And it's even more insidious than most vices because we don't even consciously acknowledge that it's a pleasure. You ever think how much pleasure we get out of being outraged? It does give us a high. That's why we're so many of us addicted to it. It, it gives us, it elevates our hormone level, all these things that kind of sends the receptors to our brain, like this sort of boost to our brain and things, even though it's diminishing returns in the end, but we like it in the moment. We're addicted sometimes to outrage. It's a pleasure to us sometimes. Each year at the end of our vacation Bible school that we do at the Ed Davis Center every summer, we have a water day for the kids. And the centerpiece of this water day is a device we know affectionately as the power shower. The power shower. Now, some of you have been to VBS at Ed Davis, you know what the power shower is. Uh, it's, a, it's a device, if I had to explain the power shower, it would be this way. The power shower is a mix between a dunk tank and a toilet. That's pretty much, <laughs> it's the, if you could take those two concepts and marry them together, you get the power shower. That's exactly what it is. And you can see here, if you go ahead and take those pictures up for me, Donna, you can see some of our volunteers. Cody over here, Cody Wright is uh, there. He's, Cody Wright's on the left. Um, <laughs> and you see Nora there too, Nora getting dunked. And if you look at the picture here, and, and there's Ricky sitting back there in satisfaction. He's like, ah, oh, yes, I made that, and I did a good job on that right there. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, a couple of our guys made that. But anyway, there they are. And if I can explain this, so like there's a bucket. If you see on top of the, uh, the device, there's this bucket, right, on top. And that bucket is fed water by a garden hose that is connected to the building at the Ed Davis Center. So the water in that bucket is not water that's been sitting out in the bucket all afternoon in the middle of a July day. This is bucket that is fresh from the spigot. It is cold. It is cold water. I mean, this is like a 90-degree day. It's hard to imagine that right now, but this is a 90-degree day happening, and like it is cold water happening. 
And so the kids, they throw the ball, and it, and it activates that little arm. You can barely see it on the other side of Cody there. But it, it activates this arm, and it activates what the mechanism in the bucket, which is essentially the mechanism that functions in your toilet, okay? So the, it's the same kind of idea. So instead of, like, the bucket just, like, falling out, the bottom of it falling out, and it's just one big instantaneous whoosh, this is like a slow, like, sort of just release of water. Like, it's, a, it's just a prolonged flow on top of your head. Imagine just the toilet, you know. And so, like, if you get a kid up there, if you get a kid up there, like some of the kids, you know, have better aim maybe than others, but you get a kid up there who's got really good aim. And let's say they were really generous with missions that year, and they got a lot of attempts to throw, you know, the ball. It's relentless. It's like merciless, okay? And so some of our kids have great aim. Some of them don't. Here's a picture of me. Go to the next picture. This is a picture of me. Now, this is caught midair. So the ball is actually making its way. I'm looking over at it. I know it's going to happen because I've been here before. I'm like, I've done this. There's, there's a little bit of a reality coming to my face right there. Uh, that's Nikki who's throwing the ball there. She's one of our, uh, she's actually one of our neighbors, not just one of our kids at the youth group, but she's one of our neighbors. She's throwing that ball and she's going to hit that thing. And this is what's going to happen. Next picture. And do you see the expression on my face when I hit that cold burst of water? Now, okay, so here's, I get the, the cold burst of water. Now, I can't remember if it was Nikki or Grant Shear was the next one in line. One of the two of them. And I mean, they were just relentless. Man, they were hitting that thing. They were, I mean, I, I was just getting like that. I mean, zoom, zoom, zoom. This water coming down on my head. I could not catch my breath. I remember I had to stop them. I had to stop and say, guys, I, got, I, got, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And I had to get out from under that thing. You now, I love the power shower. We love it. We, get, we come and you know, we do it every year. We love it. No, the kids love it. And so we love it too. And we love giving them that opportunity. But as I thought this week about our passage today, I kept going back to this illustration or this, this, this moment in time where I struggled to catch my breath. Because here's what, here's what, it made me think about constant anger, constant outrage, constant criticism, constant conflict, either coming out of us all the time or coming at us all the time, acts just like that bucket of cold water. It makes it impossible for individuals and for relationships and groups of people like a church. It makes it impossible when it's constant and when it's relentless. It makes it impossible to move forward and to move outward because all of our energy is being consumed simply by trying to breathe. It consumes our energy in a negative direction. And if we want to do more than just struggle for the space, the space to breathe in this world, I want you to turn with me today to Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 is where we're going to be. Brief verses here. It says this, Paul writes, Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, Help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. That's where we're going to stop here for a moment, just those few verses. A very brief but powerful passage in a lot of unsuspecting ways. Paul really never tells us, as you can tell from the passage, there's a disagreement between these two women. And Paul never tells us in this letter exactly what that disagreement was. We never actually know the details of that disagreement, but it doesn't matter because what Paul gives us in these few verses is all we really need to know to understand how to walk through contentment when, you know, you're, you're having and how to find contentment in the midst of, of disagreement. It's important to note one fact that we also forget when we read these New Testament letters. You know, a lot of times when we sit down with these passages, we sit down with these, these Bible books, it's usually just us in our quiet time, it's us and God in the Bible, Right? But the reality was when this was first shared with the churches, when it was first written, I mean, this was a letter that was written to a church by Paul. And when that, that church would receive that letter, this, this letter got read publicly. This, this would be like me coming up today and, and saying, well, guess what, everybody? I got a letter from Paul to the church at Georgetown. And I'm going to read that, that letter to you. And we'd be sitting here today and we, we would read that letter. Paul's letter was read to the entire congregation at Philippi. And think about how that might change the dynamics of even that little few passages we just read. Imagine you're Yodia and you're Syntyche. 
and, and you're excited. You gather together. Maybe it's a Sunday morning worship service. Maybe it's a special gathering called for the reading of this letter. But you're excited because you know that this letter is going to be read. And it's from the Apostle Paul. And you know he's in prison. So you're excited to hear a word from him. And you know, hopefully some encouragement and things. It's really an exciting thing. You haven't heard from him maybe in a while. And, and so here he comes. And, and this letter comes. And an elder in the, in, among the congregation of the messenger, they get up to read this letter. And as they go on and they get deeper in, all of a sudden you notice your name pops up specifically your name and it's not about like you know like wow look at all this great you know things that they're doing but like it's about like hey uh, stop arguing <laughs> get together get together come together and agree in the Lord and, and you hear this in front of everyone like it's not just you and Sanctiki that are hearing this it's you it, it's everybody everybody now, at first, we might be tempted to look at Paul and say, well, wait a minute, that's a little immature, right? Why bring everybody else in on this when they don't need to be in on it? It's just Yodia and Syntyche, and, you know, that doesn't seem right. But that's not what Paul's doing here. Paul, the reason Paul's responding, and the reason he's responding without a little detail here is because he's already been told it. It's been something that's been shared with him. It's been something sent to him in a letter. We've got this problem going on in our church. Can you help us? Can you speak a word into that? He's aware of it for that reason. It's already known by the congregation. It's already known by them what's going on. And so he writes to them knowing this. What Paul just did, though, is create a healthy accountability. It's not a gotcha kind of moment. It's not a kind of say, let me take your private thing and make it very public to other people. It's not like that kind of thing. Paul's, Paul's doing, he's according to Matthew 18 and all these things. But he does, what, notice what he does do. He puts everything in perspective of the greater mission. He says, agree in the Lord. Agree in the Lord. Look at what we're doing. This, does, this, is, this is temporary, but this is eternal. Let's get, to, let's get to the business of that. I want you to notice something else in this passage, too. Notice twice with each name, he uses the word entreat. I entreat Euodia, I entreat Sanctiki uh, to come together and agree in the Lord. He uses that same word for both names there. And it's our English. It's not something that's just in our English. It's actually the English representing what's in the Greek. In the Greek, the original Greek text has that word listed there twice. Why is it listed twice? It's actually unnecessary to list it twice. The reason he is doing it is it shows an intention on Paul's part to be even-handed. I entreat you, Odia. I entreat Sanctiki. Come together and agree in the Lord. He's not showing favoritism. He, he's, not, he's not coming out and, uh, and, and taking sides, which also tells us something about the nature of this disagreement. This disagreement between these two women, because Paul isn't taking sides, tells us that it's not a doctrinal issue. It's a personality issue. It's not a doctrinal issue. Paul is very, you know, if, if there's a serious doctrinal issue, like Yodi is saying to, pe to people that Jesus isn't the Christ, or Syntyche is saying, well, you know, uh, 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 there was no resurrection. You know, if he's getting into that kind of stuff, well, Paul's going to make sure. that He's going to make it very clear. No, these things happened. That's a falsehood. Move on. But he's not doing that here. He's not doing because it's a personal thing. It's a personality issue. It falls into the category of things like, well, he, she just doesn't do things the way I like. You know, she doesn't do, you know, she doesn't, uh, uh, she's not a good communicator. So, you know, I just, I, I just don't care for that, you know. And, or he, uh, she doesn't use the right illustrations that I kind of like when, when it comes to my message or the lesson or whatever she does. It doesn't, she doesn't meet my needs or my expectations. It's that kind of stuff. Most important of all, though, what Paul does in these verses is found in a phrase that he uses. When he tells them to agree in the Lord, he uses this Greek phrase, to auto phronein. He says to agree in the Lord, to auto phronein. That's the Greek phrase that he's using there. Again, remembering that this is a letter. This is a short letter that they've read in its entirety. Not like what we do where we jump in at chapter 4, verse 1. You know, they read all of this together, okay? And that phrase is a phrase that's very similar to one he's already used in the letter. And so when they hear it in chapter 4, it reminds them of chapter 2. It would have reminded them of chapter 2, verse 2, where Paul says essentially a very similar thing and applies it to the whole church. In, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, he uses this phrase, to auto phronete, which means he, it's his encouragement to the church to all of you be like-minded, having one mind. And what is the one mind they're supposed to have? He follows that up in verse 3. And their, their minds would have immediately gone back to this part of the letter. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. 
Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When Paul calls these women to agree in the Lord, he's calling them back to the example of Jesus Christ, an example that helps us and calls us back to where we can be in a place where we can see the humanity of the other person. We lose so much of the humanity of other people and the anonymity that we have in this culture today. And he's calling us back to this moment where we see the humanity in, in other people's eyes and we seek how we should love them, not tear them down. Number two, resolution is so critical here that Paul calls in another believer in order to arbitrate it. Something else that's very unique about this passage is that Paul calls in another believer in the church to help arbitrate the dispute and bring it to resolution. Our passage today calls this person a true companion. We really don't have a name for him. Some translations attempt to give him a name, but it's really just a transliteration of the word for compassion there. Uh, it's just a, or for a companion. And so he calls this person a true companion. There's a lot of mystery as to who this person is, but nonetheless, he's another believer. And if we look back at the church in, in Corinth and Paul's relationship to them, we go back to the 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 5. Remember, Paul's dismayed in that, in that relationship. He's dismayed by believers in that congregation who are taking each other to the secular courts to have their disputes decided. He says this in verse 5 of there. He says, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? The primary reason that Paul's dismayed by that is the damage it did to the church's testimony of the gospel by bringing it into the secular world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7, he says, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? That's what he was using those questions to say, the gospel's worth more than this. The gospel is worth more than these disputes that we're having. Let's come together on this stuff and let's resolve it because there's greater issues out there. Is proving whatever has offended us worth destroying the gospel of Jesus Christ in the eyes of the people who need it the most? We can be proven right, but at what cost? Number three, the more content we are in God's grace, the greater our capacity to give it. This is everything Paul's getting at. He wants to bring the church to this place of contentment because he knows that they're at this place of contentment. There's more of them to give, more resources spiritually, emotionally, physically to be, to be given toward the work of the gospel. This is all one big wrestling match. Paul knows that a church weighed down constantly with constant anger, constant criticism, constant outrage with others, constant irritation with others, all these things that focus us inward on ourselves, that kind of church will never have the capacity to be outwardly focused. There's no energy left for it. For it. When all the energy in our lives is being pulled in our own direction, there's nothing left to give to anybody else. And that's why Paul writes at the end of the letter, Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He's going to take care of everything. You're you're in a good space because you're in his grace. He's got this. Despite your quirks, despite everybody else's quirks, stop trying to perform and stop trying to make other people perform for you. That's where so much of the criticism and the anger and the outrage develop is when we're trying to control other people, which we can't do. John Dennis is the senior pastor of Holy Trinity Church in Chicago, and he said this about Philippians. He said, from first to last, the letter to the Philippians is a summons to grace, to receive it, to rest in it, and to work it out in one's life, to have the extension of it, to have the working out of it in one's life. Why do we want to be content in this life. Ironically, if it's purely for ourselves, so that I can say I have the ideal life finally, I've made it, I have finally found the way to the ideal life, we will never find it that way. What we find in Scripture is contentment is never about us. Contentment you know, is something we, we experience as a result of what God has given us freely. 
and having an attitude in ourselves where we can give it to other people freely, where we can give that grace to other people freely. It's in that, when, when we realize it's all about what he's given and all about what I can give, then, then they're really, that's when we find it. And we find that that's not really, it, that's how we find contentment. It's not something that we go and find trying to search after the ideal life for. Contentment and a generous spirit go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. So here's our takeaway today. Let contentment in God's grace lead us to generously dispense grace. Let contentment in God's grace lead us to generously dispense grace. So here's how we do this. Just three points here quickly before we close. Number one, stop fueling up on outrage. Number one, stop fueling up on outrage. Every morning, it, it creates this dissatisfaction in us, for one, a dissatisfaction. Every morning, talk radio, cable news, and our social media feed are there ready to give us our daily assignment at what we're supposed to be outraged by today. They are always going to be there ready to give us that assignment. And the more we take that assignment, the more we let the rage consume us, the less of us we have to give the gospel. So here's the message. I want to say it simply, and you might be like, kind of laugh. You might chuckle when I say this. Shut it off. Shut it off. And if we can't, because a lot of us can't. You don't know that maybe you haven't accepted, but a lot of us can't. Because remember I said, there's an addictive power to this feeling outrage. If we can't imagine ourselves living without these things on a daily basis in our life, it's time to go to Celebrate Recovery on a Tuesday night at Capital City. Our, and our, our Celebrate Recovery, by the way, is going to start... I'm getting out ahead of us, guys. <laughs> Our Celebrate Recovery here at Northside is going to start January 12th, Thursday nights. It's time to go to Celebrate Recovery and to start figuring out a little bit of more. Why do I feel like I can't live without this thing that otherwise God would say is not essential to my life? Why can't I put it down? Luke 11, 34 through 35 says this. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy... Your whole body is full of light. But when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. So stop fueling up on outrage. Number two, dare to face our shadow. Dare to face our shadow, our own shadow. Nothing I say the rest of this message matters unless we're willing to walk through this particular step. Every one of us here today has a present day shadow that is walking with us through this life. We have a present day shadow. Paul's desire, we have a divided heart in this moment because we're flesh. We're, we're, we have this war. Paul talked about all throughout Romans and things. You know about the war that we have between the flesh and the spirit, and it's there, and it's present until Jesus comes again. We all have to are in this, this, this situation. Paul's desire for the Philippian church was that it would be the safest place possible for divided hearts to live and to heal. And that's grace. But friends, let me tell you, most churches today are not safe places. They are not safe places for divided hearts to live and to heal. And that's for one reason. Because most of us here today believe we're good enough. We're good enough. It's okay enough. T.C. Ryan says this. He says, we appreciate the fresh start. We appreciate the wiping clean of our slate that the good news of Jesus is, does, does for us, but we still want to be self-justified. We want to see ourselves as people who have taken the forgiveness of the cross and gotten our act together, people who are worth being saved, but we're not saved because we're worth it. We're saved because we're loved. We still are trying to find our value and, and trying to earn our way, even after we've said yes to Jesus. The most freeing moment in my life came the day I realized that I'm never okay. My shadow, a shadow I have fought with for decades, is right here with me as I stand on this stage and I talk to you. It was with me yesterday. It will be with me an hour from now. That shadow will be there until Jesus comes and takes me home. It's a, not a past reality. It's a present reality. One choice to follow the voice of that shadow and all is all it takes for me to be back in the ditch again. I'm ever as much away, as far away from the ditch today as I was yesterday as I'll be tomorrow. My ability today to see that shadow and testify openly to you about that shadow is what makes it possible at the same time for me to love you and your shadow. 
and not react with shock and not react with horror and shame when I see it. Here's what also T.C. Ryan says. He says this, the thing about embracing our ongoing need for grace is that it's so freeing. Rather than fearing brokenness in ourselves or others, we expect it. It's not so threatening, nor do we need to put our energy into denying it. That is the foundation of a community that is truly loving. Until the church once again becomes the place where people who are on the outside of society, folks who struggle with darkness in their souls and brokenness in their lives, know that they are welcome, wanted, and loved for just who they are, we will continue to be one of the least significant organizations in our culture, just taking up space and wasting people's time. Number three. Pour ourselves into mercy and grace. This is what scripture tells us to invest all the newfound energy we have into. Once we get out from under the constant drip of infighting and the constant drip of being a church consumer. We haven't talked about that very much today, but that that weighs on our, our soul and spirituality as well. Once we get away from all of that, we get to pour ourselves into mercy and grace with generosity. Dispensing it with generosity. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 says this, bear one another's burdens and do what? And so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what we get to do. Jean-Pierre de Cassade, and I hope I said that right, (laughs) said this, what is the use of the most sublime enlightenment and divine revelation if we do not love? John Ortberg speaks of what he considers to be the greatest sin. It's the sin of lips that won't kiss, Knees that won't bend, eyes that won't weep, hands that will not serve, and perfume that will never leave the jar. It's the sin of a heart that will not break, a life that will not change, a soul that will not love. The greatest command in Scripture, generally speaking, is the command to love. Therefore, the greatest sin is a refusal to obey the greatest command. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, today as we examine so briefly this this brief passage of a division among the Philippian church, I know I'm reminded of how much energy can be consumed by, by those kind of things. I know for myself, Lord, how easy it is to be consumed with making sure I'm I'm pleasing to everybody, making sure I'm I'm fitting everybody's expectation. Lord, I know, and you know, because we talk about it a lot, Lord, how much of a struggle sometimes that is for me. Lord, all of this sort of thing, or maybe thinking about our woundedness, Lord, and we, we kind of want to dwell in a victim mentality, and, 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 and we just suck all the energy in toward ourselves. And Father, in the end, if we allow ourselves to live there, Lord, there's nothing left to give. There's nothing left to give anyone else. Father, today, you knew the importance of of resolving these kind of things and putting them in the context of the larger plan at play, the gospel and eternity. Father, there are bigger things out here. You know, I I don't want to make light of anyone's conflict. I don't. don't. Conflict happens. It's part of life. We're humans. We're all dealing with this divided heart, and sometimes that means we, we, we... we say hurtful things, we do hurtful things, there are misunderstandings, all of this happens. We, and, we, and so it, it's not, I don't mean any, to gloss over that. But I do, Father, call myself even to put it all back into its context when it comes to what's an eternal issue and, and what's a temporary one. What's, about, what's, what's going to have the greatest impact on saving souls and is my issue going to detract in some way from that message, from that goal, from your gospel. Father, today, I just pray, even as you encourage us in the Sermon on the Mount, if you're there at the altar and you realize that your, you, your brother has something against you, drop what you're doing right there and go and be resol- resolved. Be, be reconciled to them. You talk about the importance of, of getting these matters settled so that they are no longer become the big issue. 
May we work through those things together. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you today. I hope, Father, I know for myself, I love to be able to share grace with other people, and I hope that we do too. It is such a wonderful thing to see someone's heart enlightened, brightened, not enlightened as much as brightened by the fact that they've encountered you know, the gospel of grace. And, and Father, uh, I pray today that we will take great joy as we enter into this holiday season. I pray that we will take great joy in freely dispensing the gift of mercy and grace to those around us. We love you, Father. We thank you for this that is made possible through Jesus Christ, our Savior, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. If you don't know that grace and that mercy in your own life today, I want to encourage you to come forward and accept that gift of Jesus Christ as your Savior as we enter into this, enter into this time of decision as we sing our worship and praise to the Lord. Let's stand together. Above all wonders.
You may be seated. here is much different than what I've seen for the past two and a half years. <laughs> and the people that I see are much more inviting than the guy that used to sit in front of the computer and stare at me when I was doing these communion devotions. <laughs> so to be saying I'm thankful to be here and be able to do this on stage is an understatement. Being thankful kind of leads me into what I want to talk about today. November is the month of being thankful. We're getting ready to celebrate Thanksgiving Day coming up this week. It's the perfect time to talk about being thankful. I don't think we do it enough as a church. So what are you thankful for? What are you thankful for about the church? Maybe not just our church, if you attend a different church, maybe a different church. Are you thankful for a building that you can come to and be safe? Where you can come and worship God. Fellowship or just be together. Are you thankful for a preacher and leadership to preach and teach from the Bible? Are you thankful for being able to come and worship without fear of persecution? For those of you watching online, are you thankful for the technology where you can sit at home or wherever you may be and watch the service and be involved? I know for the past two and a half years, that was me. Are you thankful for the music that gets you uplifted and gets your blood flowing during the service? Are you thankful for this time in the service where we come together each week to remember the sacrifice that was given on our behalf. Are you thankful that we serve a loving God, a perfect Savior, a resurrected Lord? There are many more things that we can be thankful for in the church, but none more important than the love bestowed upon us by our God in the form of his Son, who came to be the perfect sacrifice that gives us the forgiveness of sins who rose from the grave to give us salvation and the hope of eternal life with him. Without our Father's love, his mercy, and his grace, there would be no cross. There would be no forgiveness. And there would be no hope. Psalm 106, verse 11 says, Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And of course, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. As we come around the table this morning, let us go before the Lord with thankfulness in our hearts and in our minds. Let us be thankful for the love of our God, for the sacrifice of our Savior, and for the hope of eternal life allowed only through the body and blood of our Lord and Savior. Let us be thankful for Jesus because he gave it all on the cross for us. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you with grateful hearts this morning. We are so thankful for the love that you give us each and every day. We're so thankful that you loved us so much that you would send your son to die on a cruel cross to give us hope of eternal life with you. We pray that you bless the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord and Savior as we take the communion this morning. We thank you and pray that you be with us throughout the rest of this week. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.
morning. Um, I'm going to just give a quick update on the, uh, the, the finances again. I was up here last month, but really what I want to do is just talk about where we're at uh, right before the, uh, the last month of the year. Because, uh, you know, typically some people save some of their giving for the end of the year, so I want to just show, you know, where, where are we. So um, if you could show, so this is, this is where we are, okay. So uh, through October, um, we've run a deficit in the, the general fund of $14,000 and the building fund of $50,000. Now on the building fund, we had $40,000 of uh, actual building costs that spilled over into 2022. So when the bank looks at that, they, they take those expenses out because that was really part of you know doing the building. So we had to finish up our landscaping, had a few building items, so really we're, we're close to even there. Um, on the, the, uh, the general fund, you know, obviously we're behind by 14,000. So, but you know, one thing that's been really encouraging over the last few weeks in November has been the level of offerings that we've gotten. So, you know, our average giving uh, for the first, you know, 10 months of the year has been you, just over $7,000 a week. But in November, we've gotten three offerings over $10,000. And actually two of those offerings were over 12,000. So very encouraged by that. And, you know, we, we've already have, already made up a little bit of that ground in November. And so what I want to say is that in December, uh, it's typically a higher offering month. So if you're thinking about your end of year gift, really just think about this and, and where we are. Um, you know, I, I think we've had a pretty good year considering the economic environment, and everything, but we want to keep, you know, keep pushing. And um, on the building fund, we have 29 months of payments in the fund, which is good. Uh, we're making some interest on those on that money. But again, we want to try to get eventually to where we can just fund uh, all of our expenses with our general fund giving. So um, I appreciate everybody. I appreciate your generosity, um, especially over the past few weeks. And, you know, let's let's keep it going. Thank you. And thank you, Craig, for that meditation earlier, too. So good. We've, we've enjoyed seeing you on the video, but we're also we're tickled to see you in person. <laughs> and glad to have you uh, do that today. Thank you for sharing uh, with us on that. Uh, just a few notes to pass along before we close today. First of all, I want to just pass along a note of sympathy. Uh, a number of you, especially if you've been around Northside for a while, you know uh, or remember uh, Pete and Kathy Wilhoy. Hoy, excuse me, Pat, Pete and Kathy Wilhoit. Uh, Kathy, uh, of course, passed away uh, not long ago, but uh, just recently got word that her mom, who was still living in her 90s, uh, recently fell uh, up in Michigan. She fell, hit her head, and had a bleeding of the brain and went on to be with the Lord uh, here recently. And so we just want to lift up Pete. I know he's gone up there to be part of services this weekend, so we want to encourage you to just keep the, the Wilhoit family in your prayers uh, as they, uh, they mourn the loss of uh, Kathy's mother, Joanne Clayton. So this will be Pete's mother-in-law. Uh, so keep them in your prayers, if you would. Also, just a reminder, as, uh, as uh, Rob was just saying here, we have ways in which you can contribute uh, to, uh, uh, financially to the church, and those are listed here on the screen as we do every Sunday. There's offering boxes in the rear of the room, and so we urge you to take, urge you to take uh, note of that and ask you to prayerfully consider what God's put on your heart, how to respond to what, uh, to what Rob has, has shared. Also, Angel Tree is now upon us. We are now uh, in that season of the year, and so we want to encourage you. We've got the Angel Tree set up. If you have not uh, selected your angel, uh, the whole idea is you select an angel off the tree. There's a gift there for someone in the community uh, that we ask you to purchase and bring back to the, the church here. Uh, and so we want to encourage you to be a blessing to families in our community this Christmas. Uh, and there are three ways, actually, you can give. You can do the picking of the angel from the tree. And there's a list. Kat, see Kathy Lane out in the lobby. And make sure you get uh, your signed up on that list so we know what angel you took, so we know who's got what and that everybody's covered. We also want to encourage uh, you to uh, consider also food items that you can donate that we're going to give to these families as well. So there's ways in which you can donate those, and there's places where you can leave those food items out in the lobby. Also, there's another way, and that's just simply giving a monetary donation that will help us be able to go out and, and fund getting the, the gifts that need to be gotten for some of these families if we're not able to you know cover all of them and that kind of thing. So we appreciate that 
that as well. So there's three ways you can do that. I want to encourage you to check out that table, talk to Kathy, see the trees out in the lobby, and grab your angel for this, uh, for this uh, coming holiday season. Uh, also, tonight is the last regular schedule of Sunday night activities, all right? So Bible study, youth group, uh, Awana, all that. This is the last night for that Sunday night of the year like that. Uh, and all those things will resume in January when we get to the beginning of the year. But tonight's the last night. So we still need to pick up chairs today. Uh, so if you would help us, if you're physically able to help us pick up the chairs and put them on this side of the room down here. I do have a special request, though. If you put them in stacks, please make sure they're in at least a stack of six. Uh, otherwise, it causes us to have to do some reshuffling. So please put them in at least a stack of six chairs, and that will really, really help us. With that, Wayne, if you would close us in prayer. Let's stand together and close out the service in prayer today. Again, it's been so good to be able to worship together. Everybody, have a happy Thanksgiving this week. Father, we thank you for this season of the year where gratitude is at the forefront of our minds. And uh, we have so many things to be grateful for. And I thank you for the communion meditation that enumerated a number of those things for us. And we just thank you um, for the gifts that you give us, but uh, mainly the gift of your son, because we now have forgiveness of sin and we have eternal life that is hidden in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, may we be generous in this season of coming as we celebrate your birth, and we thank you for the generosity that was spoken of of this congregation. We thank you for the opportunity to give as we see the ministries in this community continue to grow, such as Celebrate Recovery and the Circles Program and the things that we are reaching out to our community to help those um, in need. We thank you for all of those. So we just, we're blessed, Father, and Help us to be a blessing to others. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.